an event like this doesn't take place without a speaker, but it doesn't take place without someone doing a huge amount of organisation. Uh, we've had other staff that have done stuff, stuff Kathy Alkins and Praveen Mudanuri. But most of the work has been done by Ambar Sangupta. So before I introduce the speaker, I think we should thank Ambar for all of the work that he's done in organising this lecture series. Honor, and I'd like to add, I would like to thank Emily Marshall for all her help with this. Thanks. So, Maria's third talk in youth subgraphs and colour. Thanks, Maria. Hi. Hi. Hello, Gates. I guess you still don't know who I am, it probably doesn't matter. <laughs> no. um, so, this is my Third talk, and this is, so when I talked yesterday, I said uh, this is basically an advertisement for everything else I'm going to say. So this is uh, an expansion of the last uh, 15 minutes of what I did yesterday. And there's some introductions that I'm going to skip. And this is all based on uh, joint work with Alex Scott and Paul Simon. All right, so still thinking about graphs, and still thinking about click numbers and chromatic numbers. And we know that uh, the chromatic number is always at least a click number. And now I want to think about um, trying to find a bound, bound in the opposite direction. Okay, I would like to say the chromatic number is at most some function of the click number. So here it is again. Still <coughs> the same question. Um, so first of all, the first observation is that uh, this is false. There is no such function f that would do this trick for, uh, for all graphs. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm quickly going to go through this construction again, even though I did it yesterday, partly because here I didn't, I did know how to spell Michalski. So <laughs> I, I, on second attempt, I managed. Um, and uh, <coughs> yeah, so, so I was giving a similar talk at Rutgers once, and uh, I guess I was using the slides from yesterday, and Jeff Kahn came up to me and he said, do you know how to spell Michalski? And, and I knew the answer to that question. I said no. Then uh, all right, so, uh, uh, so what the Michelsky construction does, uh, it constructs a s s sequence of graphs so that for every, so that the click number is always two, and for the case graph in the sequence, the chromatic number is k. And here's how it works. This is m2, this is m3. Now we're going to build m4. So what you do is you start with a copy of m3. Here's the black pentagon, here it is. And now, for every vertex of M3, uh, I'm going to make a copy of it. So this is a copy of that, this is a copy of that, and so on. And now I make the copies adjacent to the original neighbors of the people that they're a copy of. So he is a copy of him. So I make him adjacent to this <coughs> guy and to this guy, and so on. Uh, and then you add one more vertex, which is adjacent to all this, all the second layer, and this is obviously, you know, an iterative construction. You can do it again right now. So now we build M4. Now we can build M5 in the same way, and it's easy to see that this is still triangle free, and it's a little harder, but still easy to see that um, uh, that the chromatic number keeps going up. All right, so so the class of all graphs, for the, there's no function f that works for the class of all graphs, and in fact there's an stronger theorem of Erdős, which I've also already mentioned. And what that says is, so Michelsky construction gives me a family of graphs with no triangles and with arbitrarily large chi. The Erdős theorem gives me uh, a family of graphs with no short cycles at all and uh, arbitrarily large chi. So the girth of a graph is the length of the shortest cycle. What this theorem says is that for uh, for every g and k, there is a graph with girth at least g, so no cycle of length less than g, and chromatic number at least k. So that's strictly stronger than what Michelsky did. And the proof of this is probabilistic. Uh, all right, so, so there's no f that always works. Then you can ask the question, when is there an f? When is there a function f so that the chromatic number of g is at most f of omega of g? Now, for this question to make sense, you need to spend you know, a little bit of time thinking about it. 
Because for one graph, this, is, this question doesn't make any sense. For one graph, I just have two numbers, uh, omega and chi. So asking for a function to connect them is, is, is not a question. Um, so what you want to do is, uh, and uh, you know, if you think about it for another 10 seconds, you'll realize that even if I were looking at a finite family of graphs, still, uh, it's, it's, it's not interesting. So what you need to ask is, for which infinite families of graphs is there a function so that for every graph in the family, the chromatic number is at most this function of the click number. And to make this a little bit easier to, uh, well, actually, let's say this. Let's say it like this for now. Um, what I'm about to do is say, well, actually, let's uh, make this a little easier to work with. Let's close the family under taking due suburbs. All right, so then uh, we ask the first step in this question, and that's when can you use the identity function as the function f, when our kind of mm -hmm. is the same. And that's something I already talked about twice, so I'm not going to do it the third time. But that's how you get perfect graphs. But this is sort of like another way to get at perfect graphs. It's when you think about bounding the click number, the chromatic number as a function of the click number, and you're asking for the first instance of that, for the simplest instance of that. So these are all things we already said. Let's say that again. And now we've come to the new bit. So again, I'm looking at the class of graphs. Close them and take into your subgraphs for various technical reasons. And I'll say this class is chi bounded if there is such a function f. If there is a function f, so the current number of every graph in the class is, a, is at most f of its click number. So I'm, uh, and f is allowed to depend on the class, but it's not allowed to depend on the particular graph. And we'll say f is a chi bounded function for this class. Now, I'm not saying anything about f being the best, right? It's just some function that works. So there are many chi bounding functions you can think of for the same class. And it's a different and also interesting question what's the best function you can do? But I really don't know anything about that. Almost nothing. Uh, so we'll be, from now, we'll be talking about a chi bounding function for a class. And then uh, um, this is just another bit of terminology. If I start with the graph h, then the class form of H is uh, the class of all graphs that don't contain H as an induced subgraph. One word instead of many. So then, uh, all right, so what about form of H? Maybe the class of all graphs is not chi bounded, but maybe the form of H is always chi bounded you know, for every H. Just if the um, chi bounding function depends on H. And uh, the answer is no. Uh, so, so for example, if you make H a triangle, if you take H to be the triangle, well then the Michelsky construction will tell you that four of H is not chi bounded. Right? The Michelsky construction builds triangle free graphs with arbitrarily large chromatic numbers. But in fact, more is true. If four of H is chi bounded, then H doesn't have any cycles. So let's see that. Um, let's remember Ehrlich's theorem that I have graphs with arbitrarily large chromatic numbers and no short cycles. So let's say H has 20 vertices, and let's say short means 21. So I have graphs with no cycles of length, uh, less than 21, and uh, arbitrary large chromatic numbers. Then these graphs don't contain H, because H has 20 vertices and contains a cycle. And, that mean, and they're all in form of H, so form of H is not chi bounded. So if form of H is chi bounded, then H has no cycles. In fact, the converse is also conjectured, let's say, after some of conjecture. Um, so this is, so as far as I understand it, an interesting, interesting bit of political history. Uh, so it's a conjecture that Jefferson and Sumner made independently, Jefferson in 1967 and Sumner in 1975. But the information just didn't travel. So I, mean, I, I believe everything I said. They made this conjecture independently, but it's, you know, now it's almost inconceivable that eight years would pass like that. Um, but uh, uh, so the conjecture is that the converse is true. If, if a graph has no cycles, if a graph is a forest, then uh, so the graph H, then form of H is chi bounded. And uh, this is hard. This is only known in a few cases. So Jeffrey himself proved it for the case when H is a path. And I was going to do this proof because it's easy. But it's not easy without, without the whiteboard. So I spent the last 10 minutes in my office practicing to do this proof without the whiteboard. And uh, I, I think I'm going to use visual aids here. 
these are going to be vertices, and this is going to be a component, and uh, and we'll see if it works. It, it's not a hard tool, so it should work in sort of this willingness and audience, but we'll see. Um, so, uh, so Jeff proved that uh, for bidding a path gives you a chi bounded class. And then uh, Kirsten and Penrise proved that if you forbid a tree of radius and plus two, uh, so a tree that looks like this, then, uh, then that gives you a chi bounded class. And then Alex Scott proved the topological version of, uh, of uh, uh, Jeff Sander Sanders conjecture. He proved that if you fix a tree and then you forbid as induced subgraphs, all the subdivisions of this tree. So it's sort of halfway between doing something, you know, topological in the world of minors and doing something finite in the world of uh, induced subgraphs. So fix a graph and forbid as induced subgraphs all its subdivisions. Then you get a guide bounded class. And I'll come back to to this version because there has been there have been some developments on uh, on this front. But uh, basically everything else is open. Kirsten and Penrise have a uh, uh, slight generalization of this, but not say it. OK, so, so that's about forbidding one graph, one, one age, and I want to think about four graph. Now I'm going to start forbidding families of graphs and ask, uh, and ask uh, can you make the class sky um, So the whole in the graph is just an induced cycle of length at least four. It's just a word that's convenient to use. And uh, so the strong buffer graph theorem tells you that if you forbid odd holes, right, odd means odd lengths, to forbid odd holes and complement of odd holes, then you get that chi and omega are the same. You get that the class is chi bounded with chi bounded function one. Uh, but what if I did forbid articles, but uh, I forbid some families of whole lengths? What's what's going to happen? And this is this is a good question. Uh, so the first, oh, oops, sorry. The first observation is that if something like that were to work, if I wanted to forbid a bunch of whole lengths and get a guy bounded class, I have to forbid infinitely many whole lengths because otherwise the you know the theorem of Erdős would still uh, uh, would still tell me the class is not guy bounded. Right? If I only forbid finitely many whole lengths, let's say they're all under a million, now there are graphs with no whole of holes of lengths less than a million, no cycles of lengths and lengths lengths less than a million and arbitrarily large chromatic numbers. So that's not chi bounded. So if <coughs> if uh, the family of forbidden whole lengths were to work, it needs to uh, it needs to be infinite. And actually you can tweak this argument more and you can even say, so if these are my forbidden lengths, uh, I can't have arbitra arbitrarily large gaps in it. Right? So these are the forbidden lengths. These are the lengths I can't have. But, and then I look at gaps between those lengths, so these are the lengths that I can have, and those gaps cannot be arbitrarily large. So really, you have to, have to forbid a lot of whole lengths for this to work. Uh, but uh, it turns out this is sort of a good, uh, good avenue to explore. And there were some theorems. Uh, so if you forbid all even poles, right, uh, C4 and C6 and C8 and so on, uh, then you get a chi bounded family, and in fact, chi is at most 2 omega. And uh, um, the proof of this is um, sort of, um, you, you, you get this as an, as an artifact, as a, as a corollary. What he really proves is that in every graph with no, um, with no even hole, there is a vertex whose neighborhood is a union of two clicks. And then just by the generous argument, it follows that they're chi bounded by this function. Um, then this is uh, another theorem, a more recent one, that you for, if you forbid whole, holes of length 0 mod 3, and you forbid triangles, right? So triangle for us is a hole, so it is, so it's not a hole, so I have to, I have to say this, uh, I have to forbid triangles separately, in addition to forbidding holes of length 0 mod 3. Uh, so then the theorem is again that the class I get is chi bounded, except now kind of chi bounded doesn't really make any sense because the only the only clicks I might have are of size 2. So I should just give a bound of the chromatic number. And they do, the chromatic number is at most. So I wrote 10 to the 6, and then that just means a constant. They, in fact, conjecture that it's 4, which they can't prove. But uh, I, I don't know if 10 to the 6 is really the constant again. Some, some number, not very important word. Uh, and, here, and here the proof is different. It's not sort of they don't study the structure of graphs 
with no holes of like 0, 1, 3, and no triangle, they really go for 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 proving that the chromatic number is small. So there's two two different flavors of what you could do to attack this problem. Um, so Jeffrey's probably started uh, uh, people thinking about this uh, this uh, this kind of questions. He wrote a paper called "Some Problems from the World Surrounding Perfect Graphs," which is such a lovely name for a paper. And uh, uh, and there he proposed three conjectures, all all which had to do with uh, forbidding uh, sequences of whole lengths and trying to prove that the family you get is sky bounded. And here are the conjectures. So the first one says if, if you forbid all odd holes, then the chromatic number is bounded. Okay? So it's like perfect graphs, except you don't forbid any anti-holes, but on the other hand, you don't require that the chi bounding function is identity, or just some function. That's conjecture one. Conjecture two is uh, if you forbid all long holes, so fix a number L and forbid all holes longer than that, then again you get a uh, chi bounding family. And then the third conjecture is a generalization of the first and the second. Uh, so it says, uh, generalization and common strengthening. Uh, so it says if you forbid all long odd holes, so you're allowed any even holes you want, and you're allowed any short holes you want, but among the long ones, you have to forbid all the odd holes. Uh, uh, so then the family gets sky bounded. So obviously, if you solve conjecture three, then you don't need to bother with one and two because uh, because uh, they would fall. But in fact, uh, the state of knowledge is exactly the opposite. Really, now conjectures one and two have been solved, but conjecture three is still open. So let me talk about that a little bit. Um, so about two years ago, uh, Alex Scott and Paul Seymour proved that the family of odd hole free graphs is kind of And again, this is a proof of the of the second kind. They just uh, sort of try to isolate a, uh, a, um, uh, a subgraph with high chromatic number, you know, with high enough chromatic number, and then they try to not hold there. You sort of don't learn anything about the structure of this graph. You just, just learn that in every graph with a uh, large chromatic number, uh, there, is an, an odd, uh, there is an odd hole. I mean, for comparison, so the proof of the strong perfect graph theorem is 150 pages. This proof is 15 pages. So this is a much more digestible proof. Um, but uh, if you just wanted to prove that the perfect graphs are chi-bounded, if you, you know, if you weren't so ambitious to prove that they, they all have uh, chi equals omega, this is the only proof that I know of that would do that. Uh, and the, and the, uh, the function you, you get here is 2 to the 2 to the omega. So we can you know, work really hard and prove that bash graphs are perfect. We can work really cleverly and prove that bash graphs have chromatic number at most 2 to the 2 to the omega. But there's nothing in between, which I don't know, it's a strange thing. And uh, there is a related conjecture of Hanging and Dermot that's still open that sort of proposes an approach to this, which is of the first kind, of the kind where you try to say something about the structure of the graph and then get what you wanted as a corollary. And uh, what this says is that in every all whole free graph, you can partition the vertices into two parts so that neither part contains a clique of size omega. So the clique number went down by, by at least one here and went down by at least one here. And if you could prove that, that would tell you that all whole free graphs are chi bounded with chi bounded function 2 to the omega. Because so here are your two parts. You can color this with 2 to the omega minus 1 colors. You can color this with 2 to the omega minus 1 colors. And now just put them together, and that's 2 to the omega. Um, so if, if you could solve that, then you could solve this and better. But this is for now. All right, so then the second uh, theorem is that if you forbid all long holes, uh, the family you get is sky bounded. And that's, again, uh, you just find the long hole really understand the structure too much. And what I want to do in the next uh, portion of the talk is show you some ideas of the proofs. So I, I won't actually prove any of the statements I, I claimed, but I'm going to show you some ideas that, uh, that come up. Oh, and by the way, uh, the, um, uh, the bound here is also a double exponential. 
and then depends on health. Um, so, first of all, I want to talk about the theorem that Josh Rush himself proved when he, I guess, started thinking about the subject. And that's the fact that if you forbid a path of any length, then, uh, then you get a, a chi bounded family. So now, let's see if my, my, my proof technique is going to work. Um, so, what you prove is actually something stronger. What you prove is that if some vertex doesn't start a long path, only that gives you a chi bounded family. And uh, so, let's see. Let's see if I can do that. And if not, we'll just give up. So here's a vertex. It doesn't start a, doesn't start, uh, a long path. And uh, now you look at its neighbors, and in its neighbors, the click number went down. So you can assume its neighbors you can color with not too many colors. Right? Probably everything by induction on the click number. And now you look at components of its non-neighbors. And uh, there's at least one component of its non-neighbors that still has big chromatic number, because you can color the components independently. So here's my vertex, and here's a component of its known neighbors. It has high chromatic number. And now I started with the graph being connected, so I should have said that. You have to, to assume the graph is connected. So that means there's a vertex which is adjacent to this and has a neighbor there. So here it is. The, this guy is adjacent to him and has a neighbor in this mouse pen. But now if I just look at the mouse pen plus the blue pen here, then I know that he doesn't start a long pass in this graph. Because if he did, then together with the purple guy, I would, you know, the purple guy would start a path of length one longer in the whole graph. So something got bad. In this graph, the blue guy doesn't start a path one shorter. So I know that uh, in this graph, the chromatic number is bounded by some function that's you know, better because the path is shorter. And that means every component of his known neighbor that he has independently with not too many colors. And now you put all this together and, and it comes out. Um, so let me just say something else about this proof. So this, this is a kind of nice way to present this proof. There's also the messy way to present this proof, but then you understand a little bit better what happens. So let me try that, but that's much harder with, uh, with the visual aids. So I start with the purple vertex, and now here's a component of its known neighbors of high degree, of uh, high chromatic number. So here's a blue vertex that has a neighbor in it. Now, from this, from here, I can delete all the neighbors of the blue vertex. And that set still doesn't have, actually, here we go. Just a minute. So these are the neighbors of the blue vertex. And that doesn't have very high chromatic number because uh, the click number went down. So in this part, there's still a component with large chromatic number. And now there's somebody here with a neighbor in that component. And you keep growing a longer and longer path. This is. Right, this is not nearly as pretty as the first thing I said, but on the other hand, you kind of understand how you're growing this path. You can, if you have a graph with large chromatic number, you can grow a long path always going in the direction of a component of large chromatic number, which is, which is something that's useful later. Um, so we, we, I mean, in fact, it's so useful that we have a name for it. We call it, we call it growing a Gearfish path. Start with the vertex and go in the direction of a component of large chromatic number. And I'm going to show you how Jurassic Pass come up soon. All right. So, um, actually, this is, this is not the, that slide was a definition. I did, can wait. Um, so, Jurassic's third conjecture says if you forbid all uh, long odd holes, then the chromatic number is bounded. About 20 years ago, or maybe 15 years ago, Alex Scott proved a common weakening of the two conjectures instead of a common strength. He proved that if you forbid all long holes and you forbid all odd holes, then the class, the, the class you get is sky bounded. And that proof is very nice. That, that proof I'm actually going to show. Um, so I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. But one thing we'll need to think about is <coughs> the second neighborhood of a vertex. So yes, here's a vertex. You know what its neighborhood is. It's mm -hmm. vertex is adjacent to it. And then the second neighborhood are the vertices that are not adjacent to V, but have neighbors in this set, right? So people are distance to. And probably this was way too, too much definition for this. Um, and what happens if you forbid all odd holes? In fact, if you forbid C5, mm -hmm. the second neighborhood of every vertex has small chromatic number. Now, what do I mean by small? Well, again, I'm, I'm doing induction on, on the click number. So anything I can express as a function of 
f of omega minus 1 and have this. Uh, right, so, so this is v. This set has chromatic number f of omega minus 1. That's wonderful. And then if there's no C5, you can prove that this has a um, chromatic number about f squared of omega minus 1. So, OK, so that's going to be good for us. And then there's another idea that we want. And that idea is called layering. And that's really a very simple idea, but I'll say it anyway, because it's convenient. So you start with a vertex, and you classify everybody by their distance from this vertex. Right? So first neighborhood, second neighborhood, and so on. And then you notice that at least one of these layers must have high chromatic number. How high? At least half of the chromatic number of the whole graph. Because why? Well, suppose they all had small chromatic number, then you, know, you can repeat colors. You color this layer, you color this layer with completely different colors, but now you color this layer with the colors you used up there. And now you color this layer with the colors used up here. And so there's at least one layer that uh, has chromatic number at least half of what you started with. And so, so stop there. And you can sort of forget the rest of the graph. And then for various things, it's convenient to make this part minimal. So what does it mean minimal? Well, I want for people here to be able to get back to V. So I want to make sure I want to make sure everybody here has a neighbor upwards. And then make this set minimal subject to containing neighbors of those. And then I want for everybody here to have a neighbor, neighbor upwards, but only the important people, only the people I kept in the first round of pruning. So make sure, you know, uh, so only keep a minimal subset of this that contain neighbors of, that uh, contains a neighbor of everybody, everybody here, and so on. So you can sort of uh, tighten everything. I mean, most of these applications you won't really see, but it's, it's just convenient to only keep what you need. And I'll, yeah. I'll have too many choices. It sounds like a self-help book. Um, OK, so now here's a theorem that Alex Scott proved. If you have a class of graphs, and it doesn't have, uh, so I, mean, I recommend that you don't, have, don't read the statement unless you really want to, but I'm going to tell you what it says. So I have a class of graphs, and I know that for every vertex, the second, this, this, the second neighborhood has small chromatic number. For example, it's true if I forbid C5. And I also know that there is no long hole, no hole of length at least there. Then the class is sky -bound. And let me show you the proof, because it's nice. Right, so again, second neighborhoods have one chromatic number, no long hole implies the class is sky -bound. Um, so what you do is you start with the layering, and here is my layer of high chromatic number. And now, um, so now you need to think of this picture as a movie. I'm going to tell you which which parts are appearing. So I'm going to start with the vertex v zero here, and I'm going to build a Jaffer's path in the direction of this large component. Right, so I'll take this vertex. I'll delete its neighbors. What's left still has large chromatic number. So there's a large component left there. And then there's a neighbor V1 of V0 that attaches in that component of large chromatic number, and so on and so forth. So eventually, you'll build as long a path as you want. We are forbidding holes of next at least L, so let's uh, carefully so let's, uh, build a Jaffer's path of next at least L. And so now, there's still a component of large chromatic number left. And VL uh, has neighbors in it, but other people don't. Other people, other people in their paths don't. So now we we're going to. So now I'm committed to this red path. Now I promise you to get a long hole that contains a red path. That's how I'm going to guarantee that the hole I get is long because it's going to contain this red path. So now what we say is, well, the red path, you know, it's very long. It's length L, but it's only bounded length. It's only length L. So. I can take the union of second neighbors of, every, of everybody in the red path, and I can delete them, and that doesn't drive the chromatic number down too much, right? Because we assume that second neighbors have a small guy. So here is a set of high chromatic number, and it doesn't contain the second neighbor of anybody in this red path. And now let's uh, walk into this, com into this set. So it's all happening in the component of non neighbors of all of this stuff, so the only way I can walk into that into that set is continuing from VL for a little while, and here I got into the set, I stopped. So now I want to close up my holes. Well, from here I'll go upwards because I was careful. Uh, I 
sure that everybody here has a neighbor upwards. And, uh, and then I can just go up and close like this, shortcut if necessary. I don't care because that's not where I'm going to worry about the length of the hole. I'm going to guarantee the length of the hole by including the red path. So, okay, so this is definitely a cycle. Now the question is, is this a hole? And if you think about this for a little bit, you notice that the only issue you might run into is with chords from this vertex onto this path. But then you remember that you deleted the second neighbors of everybody in the second in the red path. So if for example if this vertex was was adjacent, for example, to V2, well then what? Then this guy is a second neighbor of V2, right? You can go from V2 to here, going up and up. And that's not allowed. So in fact, this vertex cannot have any neighbors in the red portion of the path. It might have some neighbors in the black portion, but I don't care about that. I just want to preserve the red portion. So this vertex doesn't have any neighbors in the red portion. And uh, so you're happy to shortcut, you know, go along the black path until you see the first paper of this guy called M, and lead that way, and you have a hole, and it's length at least L because it contains all of the red paths. So that's, that's a proof of Scott's theorem. And in fact, uh, yeah. This is all. This is still an argument in the proof of. Uh, uh, remember, we, we were able to prove that graphs with no long holes are chi bounded. So there are two halves to the proof. Half the first half is all second neighbors are bounded. All second neighbors have bounded chromatic number, and then you do this. And then uh, the second half is in every graph with large chromatic number, there's a work whose second neighborhood has, whose second neighborhood large chromatic number, and then we do something completely different. But, uh, but this is sort of still part of the proof. All right. So now, now I want to switch gears, and I want to talk about something related but a little different. Um, so when I was talking about the Jasher Sumner conjecture that said that excluding the forest uh, gives me a chi bounded family, I mentioned that. Uh, Scott proved a topological version of that uh, conjecture, namely that if you forbid a tree in all its subdivisions as induced subgraphs, uh, you get a chi bounded family. So you can you know, continue thinking along these lines. What if I tried for more general graphs? What if I tried to forbid all subdivisions of other graphs? So, first of all, let's make this precise. Uh, so, if this is a graph, this is its subdivision. This is a graph, this is a subdivision. Um, and right, so, so you know what that means. You just put vertices of degree two in the middle of an edge. And then we're going to have form star of H, and that's family of graphs that don't contain an induced subgraph that's isomorphic to a subdivision of H. So Scott proved that for every tree T, form star of T is chi Um Now we know that for form of H to be chi bounded, you H has to be a forest. But uh, for form star, it's not clear at all because in this argument uh, that if I forbid something with cycles, then I have to uh, forbid uh, uh, long. Uh, sorry, if I forbid something with a cycle, then it doesn't appear in a graph, in a graph of large curves. That argument is not true anymore because now I'm forbidding all subdivisions. So Scott made a conjecture that uh, maybe form star of H is always chi bounded. Which is such a nice conjecture, right? I think. Uh, unfortunately, it's false. But it was open for you know for about twenty years. So it's a good conjecture. Um, so this group of authors uh, constructed a family of graphs. And actually, there's a lot of things whose subdivisions they don't contain. Somehow, this conjecture is really you know, false in many ways. Uh, Carsten Thomas has had, Thomason has this theorem. Uh, on how Hirsch's conjecture is false. So, right, so Hirsch's conjecture says that in every, if you forbid a subdivision of Kn, now not induced, then uh, the chromatic number is there, like Hadger's conjecture of subdivisions. And Carson Thomason has a paper that sort of explains all the things you could prove that are false if Hirsch's conjecture were true. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, it's, it's a very entertaining paper. So, somehow Scott's conjecture is, 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 is false in the same flavor. There are, it's not just false for one graph, it's false for most graphs. Um, uh, so, I mean, though, again, I personally love this conjecture. I'm very sad it's false. 
Um, so what this group of authors did, they constructed a family of graphs uh, with no triangles and arbitrarily large chromatic numbers. And that family in particular didn't contain this, doesn't contain this, uh, sorry, members of this family don't contain this, uh, don't contain subdivisions of this graph. Uh, but I'll come back to that later. There are many other graphs whose subdivisions they don't contain. And another remark I want to make is that graphs in this family that they constructed, they're all actually special graphs. They're what's called string graphs. So what a string graph means is you start with a collection of strings in, in the plane, a collection of curves in the plane, and now you build uh, an intersection graph. So the uh, vertices are the strings, and the um, two vertices are adjacent as the two strings intersect. And, uh, uh, and we'll come back to those later, but um, Somehow it's, it's a family of graphs people think about, is the point. And so this, uh, this graphs G1, G2, and so on, they're all string graphs. All right. So then, OK, so the Forbes star H is not uh, always chi bounded, but uh, the question is, when is it chi bounded? For which age is it chi bounded? And the answer is, I don't know. Uh, but uh, there's a, another question to which I don't know the answer, but uh, a little closer. Um, so let's say a graph is pervasive if for every graph, so H is pervasive, if, if for every G with large chi, G contains a subdivision of H, but not just that, I also promise the subdivision is long, meaning every H is subdivided many times. So it's, uh, it's um, harder to be pervasive than to satisfy this, because right, uh, I'm not excluding all subdivisions, I'm only excluding long subdivisions. So uh, just to sort of get used to this idea, uh, for example, we know the triangle is pervasive because what does it mean? That means every graph with large chromatic number has, uh, and, and large, I mean, relative to the click number, has contains as in your subgraph a long subdivision of a triangle. So, what's a long subdivision of a triangle? It's a long hole. That's Jeffrey's second conjecture. That's our theorem is, uh, with Scott and Sigma. That if you forbid all long holes, then you get a kind of class. And in fact, we can push the proof a little bit further. You can prove that this is pervasive. So it's uh, you know, many triangles sharing the base. <coughs> so then you can ask, well, which graphs are pervasive? Uh, and OK, that's, that's also a question. Um, and then you can think about being pervasive in a class. So uh, it would be nice to answer the question, for which graphs is it true that every graph with small, mega, and large chi contains a long subdivision of this? But here's something easier, for example, for which graphs H, every string graph with small, mega, and large chi contains a long subdivision of that? Or for which, you know, class in your, which graph in your favorite class? Um, no? For which, yeah, for which graphs, every graph in your favorite class with small, mega, and large chi contains a long subdivision of that? And so that's, so that, that's just sort of a convenient thing to think about. Now, uh, so actually, let me just say something else about this. So if a graph is pervasive, if a graph is pervasive, then it's pervasive in every class, right? If I know that every graph with small, mega, and large chi contains a long subdivision of this, then it's also true if I restrict this part to my favorite class. So <coughs> if you, well, not you, but uh, this group of authors, analyze, remember the, fa the family of string graphs that uh, disproved Scott's conjecture. So they analyzed which graphs are pervasive in just that family. And you know, that's, I mean, I'm not saying it's an easy theorem, but that's a task you can imagine being, uh, being able to perform. It's just one construction and you check for which graphs this construction contains long subdivisions uh, of this graph, and for each graph it doesn't. And so they did that. And it, oh, sorry. And it turns out there are actually very few uh, graphs that are pervasive in this family. And they're all what, what they call forest of chandeliers. So let me tell you what a forest of chandeliers is. Uh, so first of all, uh, a chandelier is a tree plus a vertex adjacent to its leaves. Looks like this. So you can 
now see why it's called a chandelier. Okay, you, need to, you need to go like this. Uh, and we call this a pivot vertex. The vertex that's adjacent to all the leaves, we call it a pivot vertex. Uh, so that's one chandelier. Now, to make a forest, of, to make a tree of chandeliers, you can connect chandeliers on one vertex cut sets, except every time I make a connection, one, the cut point has to be a pivot for one of the chandeliers I connect. Again, the details are obviously not incredibly important now, but it's, you know, you, you take a bunch of those and you somehow stick them together on one vertex cut sets and you do it with some care. And then the next thing you can do is take the chandeliers of those. That's why it's a force of chandeliers and not, uh, not the tree of chandeliers. So they proved that the only graphs whose log subdivisions must be contained in, in you know, people in this family are uh, forest and chandeliers. So that means the only pervasive graphs in the world are forest of chandeliers. And you can make conjecture. You can say a graph is <coughs> pervasive if and only if it's a forest of chandeliers. So uh, let's go back here. Uh, we don't know anything about this graph and uh, we don't know, uh, sorry, we don't know anything about this question. We don't have an answer for this question, but at least we have maybe a conjecture. Or at least I can reformulate it. I can say, is it true that the graph is pervasive if and only if it's a force of chandeliers? And uh, we, have a, uh, we have some progress on that, so we can prove that uh, uh, force of chandeliers are pervasive in stream graphs. So we understand all graphs that are pervasive in stream graphs, they're precisely forests of uh, chandeliers. And um, so what happens here, um, so basically there are two, I mean, if you're trying to prove this in general, let's say you're trying to prove that forests of chandeliers are pervasive. So there are two cases that can happen. One case is for every vertex, it's a, for every vertex the second neighborhood is bound. And maybe also the third and the fourth in any sort of, for any constant, the case neighborhood has bounded, bounded chromatic number, bounded in terms of the click number. And then there is the other case, which after some thought comes out to be in any graph with small click number and large chromatic number, there is a vertex whose case neighborhood has large chromatic number. So this, this is the dichotomy. Um, it's not immediately obvious, but it's not hard. So in the second case, if I can arrange that there is always a vertex whose case neighborhood, or second or third neighborhood, or something that is, uh, has bounded chromatic number, that's great. Then I can prove force trend, long subdivision of force of chandeliers are present. But in the other case, which seems to be the nice case, when all bounded, uh, all bounded distance neighborhoods, bounded radius neighborhoods, have small chromatic number, that's the case where we're stuck. That's the case where we have no idea what to do. And the reason it works for string graphs it's because you can prove that if a string graph has large chromatic number, then it has a vertex whose, uh, I forget, has a second or third neighborhood has large chromatic number. And so the half of the proof we know how to do works, and the half of the proof where we completely stack doesn't come up. Um, and uh, let me stop here. Thank you. Questions? Go. Uh, is there a structure theorem for graphs without long folds? No, I wish. I mean, we don't even know the harm of term. Some, some, some close, uh, or at least a conjecture or something. Any suggestion what kind of structure it would be? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, how about it? perfect graph? Did you say long folds or long folds? Uh, uh, just long folds. I mean, the, the answer is the same. To, uh, I don't know why. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Okay, the last speaker that we had in this Pocelli series was Susan Murphy, and she was elected to the National Academy of Sciences this week. So we've had a wonderful set of lectures from Maria. Let's uh, join together and hope that she is soon elected to the National Academy of Sciences. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Thank you very much.